In the early 1990s, the French capital of Paris found itself the unwilling hunting ground of Nico Clo, a self-proclaimed satanic necrophile who spent years prowling in the city cemeteries in order to unearth and mutilate corpses before moving on to the fresher flesh found within hospital morgues until not even the dead could satisfy his gruesome proclivities. Before we get started, a word of warning. This story contains graphic details relating to some of the most depraved acts known to humankind. Cannibalism, necrophilia, Satanism, and of course, homicide. But if you think you can stomach it, let's dive in to the case of Nico Clo, the Vampire of Paris. Welcome to Fear Files, where we discuss and dissect the most mysterious, terrifying, and mind-bending cases from all over the world. Before we get started, we would like to send our thoughts and prayers to the loved ones of Thierry Bissonnier, who fell victim to the abominable actions described in this case. This story takes us to the French capital of Paris, widely considered one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Located along the River Seine, Paris is famous for its majestic boulevards and monuments, quaint bohemian quarters and cobbled laneways, a city that's become synonymous with love and romantic weekend getaways. And then there's the other side of Paris. Famous Gothic cemeteries and architecture, ancient crypts, vaults and dungeons, museums devoted to the strange and morbid, from vampirism to collections of human cadavers that have been pickled. Paris is a city just as famous for the dark and macabre as it is for romance. You need only think of what lies below those boulevards, a veritable empire of death a vast network of tunnels within no less than six million corpses are entombed, their bones stacked into artful layers within the tunnel's walls. In other words, all in all, Paris was an especially fitting backdrop for the predator who roamed the streets back in the early 1990s. On November 15, 1994, a team of crime scene investigators arrived at a rundown apartment in the red light district of Paris, not far from the famous Moulin Rouge. The apartment was that of 22-year-old mortician Nico Clou. The search, part of an investigation into a recent series of homophobic shootings that had taken place across the city. Nico Clou had been taken into custody earlier that day after a five-week manhunt. Nico had attempted to buy a video recorder using the stolen credit card and forged ID of a man named Thierry Bissonnier, who, just hours earlier, had been shot dead in his own apartment. Once in custody, police noted that among his many occult-inspired tattoos, Nico had the words serial killer down the back of both arms and predator across his abdomen. But nothing could have prepared the investigators for what lay inside the dingy apartment at 9 Rue Cousteau. Hanging from the ceiling were human leg bones and vertebrae fashioned into a morbid mobile. Scattered on every surface were human teeth and bone fragments. Hundreds of videotapes, mostly slasher and hardcore S&M, filled the shelves. An urn covered in dried blood sat by the phone. A bullet-riddled Bible had been nailed to one shotgun-spangled wall. Posters depicting savage and violent imagery covered every other. A more extensive search uncovered a backpack containing handcuffs, surgical instruments, and duct tape. And, under Nico's bed, a 22 caliber handgun, which was sent for ballistics testing. And inside his refrigerator, bags of fresh human blood. It was a glimpse into a world so warped it was almost beyond comprehension. 
the mind of someone consumed by death, violence, necrophilia, and cannibalism. Someone whom they now suspected of being a serial killer. During his first police interview, Nico denied any knowledge of the murder of Thierry Bissonnier. When confronted with the positive results of the ballistic test, however, he promptly confessed. He had shot Thierry, he admitted, after randomly meeting him on Minitel, an early precursor to the internet. The murder of Bissonnier was eerily similar in MO to other recent shootings. All the victims had been gay men shot in their apartments soon after connecting with someone on Minitel. But no evidence linked Nico to those shootings, and he would not admit any involvement. He would, however, provide a full and graphic confession to the murder of Thierry Bissonnier, including a gruesome explanation for the blood bags and human remains found in his apartment. It was a confession so shocking it would generate a frenzy of media attention and earn Nico the title Vampire of Paris. I understood that from now on for the rest of my life I would be considered as a monster. Nico Klo was born on March 22, 1972, in Cameroon, Africa, to French parents. Nico's father was a computer technician whose job required the family to regularly relocate to foreign countries. By the time Nico was six, he had lived in Africa, England, Switzerland, and France. But while Nico's parents provided generously for their only son, his mother was emotionally absent and showed little to no interest in him. His father was mostly away on business. Frequent moves made it hard for the naturally introverted Nico to make friends. Nico withdrew into himself and grew emotionally cold and indifferent. I've always felt like an outsider. And uh... I never really understood what the dynamics of what was going on around me in terms of human interactions. And I, I never fit in. Then, when Nico was 10 years old, came the moment that would direct the course of the rest of Nico's life. Nico had persuaded his grandfather to play a game of badminton with him. But during the game, his grandfather had suddenly suffered a stroke and dropped dead right in front of the horrified child. According to Nico, his family then blamed him for his grandfather's death, chastising him for having insisted. Surprisingly though, this wasn't Nico's defining moment. That moment was simply Nico's first exposure to death itself. Of course I felt, you know, grief because uh, I really liked him but I was very intrigued and fascinated by the wake and this was my first experience with physical death and uh, it, it was some kind of uh, awakening for me. I was fascinated by the, uh, the room itself, the, the, the funeral home, the people who worked there, the, the casket, and the atmosphere around me. And I felt uh, a connection to the energy that was going on there. Mm -hmm. And I felt more alive in a way than uh, in my normal environment. Soon after his grandfather's death, Nico's mother began having nightmares. Often she would wake up screaming that Nico was trying to kill her with his mind. She accused Nico of having supernatural powers. His mother would later end up being hospitalized, but would spend the rest of her life living in fear of Nico. Gut instinct, perhaps? Or a kind of projection of her own insanity onto Nico, impressing on him an image of himself as a demonic killer long before he'd even contemplated it. 
With a morbid new interest to explore, Nico took to reading everything he could on death, the afterlife, and the underworld. He read about vampires and werewolves, black magic, and the occult. He developed a fascination with the Sumerian god Pazuzu, later immortalized in the film The Exorcist. There is so many different representations. The one I feel more close to is the image of Pazuzu, the Assyrian demon, which I have tattooed on my, uh, on my wrist here. When Nico's father, who was an enthusiastic amateur anthropologist, returned from his trips, Nico would listen enthralled to his stories and images of voodoo rituals and witch doctors in Africa and the Hell Gardens of Thailand. Soon, Nico's interest expanded into cannibalism. At around 11, Nico had come across an illegal copy of a magazine that contained graphic images of the corpse of a woman murdered by Japanese cannibal Issei Sagawa. The images had a huge impact on Nico. According to the satanic teachings he had been studying, consuming the flesh of another allowed you to absorb their power. Now, whenever he ate meat, Nico would fantasize that it was human flesh. There is a belief in certain satanic cults that uh, cannibalism is a communion with the devil. And this is the way I spiritualized the things that I did. There was always uh, in my mind the, the thought of uh, uh, taking lives and uh, feeding from the energy that was released when you kill a human being. When Nico started high school, his obsession with death shifted up a gear, this time to thoughts of murder. The family were living in Portugal at the time, and Nico attended a school for French expats, but the majority of the school was wealthy locals who excluded the expat minority. Nico had always viewed others as potential threats. Now the feeling overwhelmed him. They would talk about me all the time, but in Portuguese, I wouldn't understand what they were doing, but I was smart enough to understand that it was not really uh, good. And I started to develop all those fantasies about actually going to school with a knife and stabbing them uh, uh, one by one, one after the other. So yeah, there was a time between, I, I would say 12 and uh, and 14 or 15, when I had this, those really violent fantasies and those uh, obsessive thoughts about hurting them. I would wake up in the morning and think about it. I would go, I would see them and think about it. I would, you know, leave school and think about it on the way back home. And, uh, and, and when I was home and reading true crimes, I would think about ways of doing it, so. His murderous fantasies became graphic and detailed. He studied anatomy books on how the body worked and how best to kill it. By now, his parents couldn't fail to notice that Nico had developed some unhealthy preoccupations. But it wasn't until he pulled a knife out at school and threatened to kill another student that they sought help from a psychologist. Before they'd located one, however, the family had to move again. When Nico was 16, he met a lifelong friend, Ignor Mortius. He was living in Paris with his father. Ignor describes his first encounter with Nico. But Nico's preoccupations were now radically different to everyone he knew and his sense of being disconnected from the human race stronger than ever. Later, when corresponding from prison, he would write, When I see people, I see complete aliens. I cannot understand their craving for social success, family, and love. I do not have the same primal needs. Nico took to wandering alone through the elaborate crypts and tombs of Paris cemeteries. Here, Surrounded by death, he felt alive. Between the age of 16 to uh, 21, yeah, I would spend all my free time. I would even skip school 
ditch school to go to uh, to graveyards. So uh, because this is the only place where I felt, you know, in peace with myself in a way. And um, they were my territory. There was also this idea of owning the place. But soon he wanted more. He wanted access to the coffins and the bodies. From Poisset Prison in 1999, he wrote to Sandra London of his interest in human corpses. Later, in 2006, he had edited his description of his own necrophilia to exclude sexual desire or interest in post-mortem sex. I have a, uh, an attraction to dead bodies which is not sexual. Uh, it's purely aesthetic. I like the way they look and I like the texture of the skin. In our interview with him, he denied any sexual interest in dead bodies. At any rate, after months of studying lockpicking, Nico found ways of breaking into the crypts. Once inside, he reveled in the dark and dank, the smell of death. It was an intensely spiritual experience, he said. He was breaking the last chain linking him to the rest of humanity. This is an abbreviated version of the confession he gave French authorities about his first experience with a corpse. After violating his first grave, Nico spent his time searching for new ones to desecrate. Once inside a crypt, he would often spend whole nights with the bodies, performing satanic rituals or meditating, and he began to collect souvenirs. First, he stored them at his parents, later at his apartment on Rue Cousteau. It was a pastime he would continue right up until his arrest. If there was skulls, I would get the skulls. If uh, there, there was anything that I could get and put in my backpack, I would bring it home. So uh, I was still living at, at my parents back then, and but they had this uh, basement that they would never use. So I, I put everything in there uh, under lock. So I had like yeah, plenty of skulls and uh, human remains in. in in several uh, several bags, trash bags. Sometimes I would uh, get them out of the trash bags and uh, uh, just you know hold the skulls or place them on an altar. That I had a makeshift uh, altar. At 18, Nico began going to goth clubs and death metal gigs. But even there, he felt like an outsider. His girlfriend shared some of his fantasies but was overwhelmed if he mentioned his darker ones. The people I would walk by in the street or while taking the subway, they were like ghosts to me. They weren't even real. I didn't even, I couldn't even imagine that they were actual human beings. In 1992, at the age of 20, Nico joined the military for a short spell, working as a gunsmith where he stole several weapons. The following year, he attended university, studying, ironically, psychology. At the university campus was a tall tower that reminded him of the mass shooting committed by Charles Whitman from a university clock tower in 1966. Nico made it his goal to do the same. Over the coming year, he would make plans to do so. It was not a the fact of actually uh, hurting people, but taking more or less their, their souls. Mm -hmm. So I, I had this like spiritual idea, spiritual motivation. Drinking blood was taking the energy from people, feeding on the energy mm -hmm. and killing them eventually uh, would be the ultimate way of feeding on their energy because you actually take it. In 1993, Nico finally found a job that would bring him in close proximity to death. He became a morgue attendant at St. Joseph Hospital. Nico's duties involved helping to conduct autopsies and stitching up corpses. Often, after the autopsy, Nico would be left alone, suturing a cadaver. Nico could now indulge his cravings he'd had since childhood. He took to procuring small strips of muscle from the corpses, sometimes eating them raw, other times taking them home to cook. 
When I started to work in the morgue and I started to attend autopsies, I was in contact with uh, raw human meat, so sometimes I would uh, swallow meat from the person. Then after, I would uh, sometimes bring it home and cook it. There is a belief in certain satanic uh, cults that uh, cannibalism is a communion with the devil, and this is the way I spiritualized the things that I did. In his confession to French authorities, Nico also described having sex with corpses. In prison, he wrote several times of post-mortem sex. He has since claimed that these statements are false. Nico had another job at St. Joseph Hospital. It involved delivering blood bags from the hospital's blood bank to the surgery room and returning unused blood bags. Nico devised a way of taking unused blood bags home without being detected and began to indulge another lifelong fantasy, consuming human blood, which he drank on its own or mixed with human ashes or a protein powder. I enjoyed the taste. I enjoyed the, the rush that I would get from it. Um, it was my way of uh, feeling kind of high, maybe. So, uh, yeah, I, I got hooked on that. There was one downside to his new job. His three colleagues, his co-workers, were a tight clique who had worked together for several years. Once again, Nico felt like the outsider. Worse still, his co-workers didn't seem to appreciate the privilege it was to work with the dead. Nico decided to kill all three and began making plans of how to do so. For me, it was uh, definitely a, a way to cut the umbilical cord that had still attached me to mankind, in a way. I had this theory back then that uh, humanity needed predators. Nature's response to that was to create people like me who acted as predators of the human race. When one of his colleagues invited him to his place for a drink, Nico brought a pen knife. I went to his place and he was talking and he was talking about work. Uh, I decided that, yeah, I had to find a way to get rid of them. Nico decided he would try again and this time kill all three. He would then conclude his criminal spiral with a mass shooting from the university campus tower. First, though, Nico wanted to do some target practice with a new gun he bought. On the morning of October 4, 1994, Nico went looking for a victim. His girlfriend at the time was a dominatrix sex worker who contacted her clients via Minitel. The messaging system was mostly used for sex services. If used at a public library, there was no way to trace the interaction. So I was inspired by that because I understood that it was an easy way to approach a victim and uh, actually somebody who would be wanting to engage in some sort of uh, SNM uh, fantasy. And but my my goal was uh, absolutely not to do anything uh, of that kind, but actually go to that person's place and uh, shoot the person. Nico logged on to Minitel. Soon, he had made contact with 34-year-old Thierry Bissonnier, a longtime resident of Paris, restaurateur, and part-time classical musician. Thierry was in a stable relationship, but occasionally engaged in anonymous sex with strangers interested in bondage and S&M. Nico lured Thierry into a conversation about bondage and eventually coaxed him into a meeting at Thierry's apartment at noon that day. Thierry gave Nico his address. This is an abbreviated description of what happened next in Nico's own words. When I arrived at his place, he opened the door. I stepped inside, quickly turned around while he was closing the door and pulled out the gun. I looked at his face just as he turned his head towards me and saw the gun pointed at his eye. After a few awkward moments passed, I pulled the trigger. He instantly fell face down without a word. Then I watched him bleed on the carpet. Soon I decided to see what the apartment was like and wandered around a bit. When I returned, he was still moving 
and making horrible breathing noises on the floor, like if he was breathing through a straw. I reloaded the gun and shot again, this time striking him in the back of the head. I reloaded and fired a few more times, but he was still alive and making noise. I was surprised that he was still holding on. I had expected the first shot to kill him. After a few minutes, I went into his kitchen and found some cookies to eat and then sat in the corner of the room and watched him as I ate. I shot him one last time in the back. I also lifted a huge plant container and smashed it on his head, crushing it some. I then wiped down my fingerprints, picked up his checkbook, a credit card, and a wallet with his ID papers, his driver's license, an alarm clock, and an answering machine, and left the scene. Later, Nico would write about the killing in even greater and more gruesome detail, adding how he inserted a pencil into one of the bullet holes to see how deep the bullet had entered the skull. In 2006, he talked of it as the ultimate experience. I shot a man in the eye, uh, then I shot him several times again in the back of the skull and in the heart. It lasted uh, 30 minutes, maybe. That was the ultimate experience for me, taking a life and feeding uh, from the life. It was like uh, cannibalizing a soul and uh, giving it to a uh, wild old. 18 years later, he is much more reticent about the crime, skipping over details. He describes his feelings at the time of the murder as mixed but single-minded. He knew he was going to kill again. I just was saying to myself, self, there's no way back. And uh, I'm driving forward. So I want more. I want to feel alive once more. I want to serve the Grim Reaper once more. Three days later, Thierry Bissonnier's parents, alarmed after not being able to reach him, entered his apartment, only to be met by a terrible sight. Their son's butchered and decomposing body lying on his apartment floor. Nico might have gotten away with the murder, but it was just the start of an ambitious plan and he was impatient to take the next step. Hours after killing Bissonnier, he entered a shop with Bissonnier's forged ID and credit card and attempted to buy a video recorder. He'd been hoping to record his next murder, which was to be his three co-workers at the morgue and which he'd planned for Christmas Day. But the clerk became suspicious of the crudely pasted headshot of Nico over Bissonnier's, and Nico had fled without the recorder or the ID. Nico was arrested five weeks later on November 15, 1994, when a passing policeman recognized him from that image. It had been circulated to every metropolitan police station in Paris. Brigade criminal investigator Gilbert Thiel was the lead investigator into the murder of Thierry Bissonnier, as well as the other nearly identical shootings in Paris and was convinced that only one person was responsible. He would later claim during Nico's trial that he fit the profile of a serial killer, but a lack of evidence meant Nico was never charged with those crimes. During his police interviews, Nico initially claimed that he'd murdered Thierry as part of a robbery gone wrong. He then claimed it was an act of revenge taken out on a random gay man. None of them held water or accounted for the bags of fresh blood and human remains. So, Nico gave a final, shocking, and explicit confession, parts of which you've just heard. He was a satanic necrophile, he said, and went on to describe in graphic detail his acts of grave desecration and cannibalism. I understood that from now on for the rest of my life, I would be considered as a monster. So when you understand that and when you see the outside and when you see police officers who've worked on the field for 20 or 30 years act the way they acted when they searched my apartment, you understand that 
it's over. You won't be able to, to, to be part of, of the system anymore. During his two years in custody, Nico underwent a battery of psychological tests. He told psychologists that corpses in the mortuary had been speaking to him, urging him to kill. He would later tell an interviewer that he'd invented this part in hopes of getting some reduced sentence. Nico was now diagnosed as psychotic with a penchant for necrophilia and sexual sadism, but fit to stand trial for premeditated murder. In May of 1997, Nico Klu was convicted of premeditated murder and armed robbery, along with fraudulent use of a bank check, falsification of a driver's license, and an attempt to defraud. He was never charged with grave desecration, cannibalism, or stealing blood. In his interview with us, he said the prosecution deliberately left the charge out to avoid a reduced sentence on the grounds of insanity. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison, of which he would only serve eight. He was released in March of 2002. Nico spent years corresponding with around 30 different killers and serial killers. Many were boring, he said, and in denial of their crimes and their demons. He felt a connection with others, however, the most significant of which was Issei Sagawa, the Japanese cannibal who had made such an impression on him as a child and with whom he would correspond for a decade, later collaborating with him on art. Nico began painting serial killer-inspired art in 1996. According to Nico, art would be his turning point and redemption. What I found interesting was that I could actually summon and master my demons through another, another way of expression, which was art. For several years after his release, Nico tried to enjoy his new celebrity horror show status as the vampire of Paris who sold serial killer-inspired art. But the novelty soon wore thin. Everywhere I was going, I was considered as a sideshow freak. And I, and I tried to, you know, find communities that would accept me, like uh, the God community or the, 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 the vampire community. And each time they would say that I would give their community a bad name. So even in those more or less different communities, I, I was considered as, a, as an outcast. Nico decided to change his name and start over, moving away and taking multiple jobs in different morgues. But his infamy followed him, and he was fired repeatedly. So he reinvented himself once more, this time as himself, the reformed Satanist and killer. He knew he'd never kill again, he says, because he wasn't tempted. It wasn't for moral reasons, it was because he got more pleasure from channeling his obsessions and demons into other outlets, like art, painted partly with his own blood. And then there's his writing. Some of it farcical, like the Cannibal's Cookbook, he has written an autobiography, The Gospel of Blood, and soon-to-be-published book on Richard Ramirez, The Night Stalker, and The Woman Who Wrote Him. Over the years, the way in which Nico describes his crimes has changed subtly, which makes it difficult to know what precisely is true and what is not. Did he talk up the morbid side of his crimes at the time of his arrest to get a reduced sentence? Or does he talk them down now, knowing that anything too disturbing might overstep the social boundaries that for so many years pushed him out into the role of an outsider? We'll never know, but hearing what this reformed cannibal and killer advises other killers perhaps captures Nico better than anything else. He is often contacted by wannabe killers experiencing violent impulses and seeking tips on committing murder. To them, he has this to say. It's a simple choice, and I think it's the most effective argument why not to act on those urges because when you understand that you're going to feel alive for 
several hours, but what then? You will eventually get arrested, go to prison, and maybe spend the rest of your life, natural life, in prison. Is it really worth it? Creativity is way more satisfying. This is what mm -hmm. I try to make people understand who have those dark urges. Just the fact of not being the person that they want you to be is satisfying. And this is uh, one of my biggest highs now. People expect me, of course, to be this person who will go back to my uh, old ways and uh, do those things or who've been doing this ever since I was released and they will, you know, uh, one day uh, they, they will find uh, this uh, mass grave somewhere. But no, no, I just want to disappoint people in that way. And uh, I, I don't want to be part of the narrative. Mm. You see what I mean? Mm. And uh, what I appreciate uh, is that those people who think that they can predict me, they can't. And this is what I appreciate the most, maybe. Yeah. If you found this story compelling, don't forget to like the video. Comment down below your take on it and subscribe to the channel. Also, hit that notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. If you have a case you'd like to see given more coverage, drop us a line in the comments. And thank you for your support. We're grateful for every one of our subscribers. So, until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.